All right, all right, all right. Southern Nazarene University, make some noise, make some noise. Yes, yes, yes. Some of y'all are like, I don't know who this is, but I know who you all are. Southern Nazarene is a special school in my life. My name's Jonathan Hill, and we've got some legacy here at this school. My little brother went here, Andrew Hill. My other little brother went here, Clarence Hill. They were on a basketball team. Any basketball players in the house, make some noise. Thank you. All two of them. I thought it takes five to make a team. Basketball players, make some noise. Uh, yeah, there we go. There we go. They just woke up. That's okay. That's okay. Yeah, we got legacy here. This school is special to me uh, because of the fact that this school exists is the reason I'm even here in Oklahoma. Yeah, somebody decided to give a scholarship to a young, young, young man named Clarence Hill Jr. and that recruited him from the lands of Iowa to here. And it, as a result, a few years later through a prayer meeting, we decided to move down here. So it's because of this school that the Hills have migrated from Iowa to Oklahoma and I'm glad to be here. This is a great school, a great college and a great legacy. But enough about me, I, 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 I love to talk about me more, but the greatest thing I'm proud of is my family. I'm married, I've been married for 27 years. Thank the Lord Jesus. Y'all are giving a hand for my wife for putting up with me for 27 years? Yes. We didn't have TVs in our home or anything like that, no type of entertainment, so we decided to have six kids. Oh, yes, oh, yes. Six beautiful children. I believe one may be here, two here. One of them's gotten married, so I have a grandchild here. So I'm a granddaddy. That's good. I talked to you about family because it's one of the most important things in my life. And I know right now I'm talking out here to future fathers, future mothers. It's one of the greatest goals you can have in life, all right? Outside of your education in college here and things like that, you land yourself as a parent. It's one of the greatest institutions, and you can raise godly seed for generations to come. Family is an awesome thing. I wish I could come back and talk to you more about that. But today, I want to talk to you about a trustworthy saying. Trustworthy saying. In the New Testament, Paul wrote close to two-thirds of it, and throughout it, you would find him continuing to say this phrase, this phrase, this is a trustworthy saying, okay? And a trustworthy saying, that's kind of like his phrase for saying, hey, listen up. Like my uh, daughter, she's a, she's a student over at MacU, and she always says this when she's really trying to emphasize something. She'll say, listen, Daddy, literally, this is what happened. Who, how many of y'all are literally people? Yeah, 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 some of y'all, yeah. when you're really trying to make your point, literally, and, and there's all types of other phrases. Here, I, I, I'm serious now, right? I, I promise you. You're right. You know, we all have our little phrases where we're trying to stress this is something that's very important. Well, Paul summarized at least five times these trustworthy sayings. I'm not going to go through them all because I only have three hours today, but I'm only going to talk about one. One trustworthy saying that Paul had is found in 2 Timothy 2, 11 through 13. The saying is trustworthy for if we have died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful for, the, for he cannot deny himself. I'm gonna land right at the beginning of that. If we died with him, we will also live with him. Say this with me, say dying to live. So if you're taking notes like good college students, I know you're going to write this down as dying to live. I want to talk to you about what true living is all about. There's a misnomer in our society today that just because you see somebody walking and around and batting their eyes that they're alive, and that's just not true. I Compare it to the analogy of like there's a lamp, there's a favorite lamp in my room, and if that lamp was sitting there and it was unplugged from the wall, but yet I still turned the light switch on, the lamp would not illuminate, right? Doesn't take an electrical engineering degree to figure that out. But if I take that lamp and I plug it into the wall, then when I turn the switch on, 
Let there be what? Light's going to happen, right? Well, the death that's talking about in this passage where it says if we have died with him, we will also live with him, is that type of a death. It's a death that's separated from the light. Separated from the power source. In my analogy, the lamp is plugged into some type of a wall outlet and it supplies power that, if you're here in Oklahoma City, probably comes from some type of an og and substation somewhere. But the type of light that I'm talking about is not just dealing with electrons and protons. The type of light that I'm talking about is a person, okay? Say I'm dying to live. Yeah, I'm dying to live. I'm dying to live. Before I end this message today, I want all of you to be thirsty for true, true life. The only way that you can have that light turned on is by being plugged into the source of all life. God is the one that created all mankind. Yes, he is. Does anybody disagree with that? If so, don't raise your hand. God created us all. So since God created us all, he is the one that gives life. So we have to be connected with the life giver in order to say that we have life or light. So there's nothing that explains it better than a passage of scripture found in Romans chapter 6. You can write this down, verses 5 through 14. It does a way better job than I could. It says, if we be united with him in a death like his we shall certainly be united with him in resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be destroyed to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. Let me pause there for a minute. You know, we just came back from Savannah, Georgia, so we got to deal with and study a lot of history and when you go in Oklahoma, you see buildings, because I'm a structural engineer, and I look at buildings and houses all day long. You know, the oldest house I've been in was 115 years old. When you go down to Savannah, Georgia, the oldest house was 300 years old. And there was tons of history in Savannah, but there was one thing that came across that just rubbed me the wrong way. There was an older man that had had a house in the city, and he was a builder, and he went around building houses all around and properties, and he got in some debt. He got yellow fever and died and left his wife with the business. And the business had a lot of debt. And in that debt, they had to liquidate all the things that they owned. And then there was a list, and they have it in this house, because the house is a museum now, and in the list, it listed all of the property. And then there was listed nine Negroes for $2,154. So this Negro was a little upset about that, just looking at it. You know what I'm saying? It's okay. It's, it's all right. It's all right. It's all right. I know we're in a different day now, but it struck me, and it was a reminder to me that my people were once enslaved. And to be enslaved means that you don't have control over your own life. So as we're walking around this house, they were talking about the architecture and everything. All I could think about in my mind is what did the slaves do in this house? I won't even talk about some of the things they ended up having to do because it made me more upset. Then I shook it off and realized I'm in 2023 and we understand about racial equity and how to treat people with equality. And Southern Nazarene said, amen. But that point still reminded me that there were people that were once enslaved. That means they could not make choices of their own. They had to listen to someone that called themselves a master. When I read this scripture, it says, we know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be what? Enslaved to to sin, right? I'm dying to live. You see what I'm saying? You see, but there's a culprit in our life that hinders us from experiencing true life, and it's called sin. So a person that has not taken their proverbial lamp and plugged it into the outlet to the power source, in essence, can be a dead man or a dead woman walking. 
because you have not tapped into the true life source, which is found in God through his son, Jesus Christ. When I think about being enslaved, I just realized three generations ago, because my brother did the, what's that called, 23 and Me? What's the thing where you spit into a napkin and mail it off or something? Yeah, something like that. He did it. Found out about my ancestors, so I was able to find out where we had come from, where we ended up landing. So I have this knowledge and awareness of being enslaved, and, and, and then I understand some of the, the dynamics of it from reading historical documents. But here's the truth about it. It's not just a race of people that are enslaved. It's a group of people that continue to decide to live their own life their own way. Those are the ones that are enslaved. It's the person that decides that I don't need the power source. I don't need God in my life. I don't need Jesus in my life. Instead, I'm going to do it my own way. Those are the ones that are enslaved. You see, it says here in this scripture very clearly, for one has died and has been set free from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we also will live with him. Say, I'm dying to live. Yeah, yeah, we're dying to live. You see what I'm saying? I am making myself aware that there is a wonderful, wonderful person named Jesus Christ who was fully God, fully man, who the Father sent down here to die in my place. So in order to experience on this college campus true life, you have to first die. You might say, that doesn't make sense to me, Jonathan. How can I die first and then try to live? Well, you have to identify with a death that has already taken place. Yeah. You identify with the death that has taken place. You see, we as believers in Jesus Christ, we identify with something that took place over 2,000 years ago. The reason is, and I don't have time to expound on this today because I still only have two hours left, is that in Leviticus, the Bible says the life of all flesh is in the blood. How many of you ever seen a person alive that did not have blood in their body? Please don't raise your hand. You're going to prove that you didn't go to this college, okay? Don't raise your hand because it's not possible. Y'all with me? All living people have blood in their bodies. If I'm right, say amen. Amen. So the life of all flesh is in the blood. So we're beings that exist with blood pumping through our veins. Well, in order for us, I believe my brother Danny Thompson might have shared with you guys, we were all born in sin, disconnected from God. If you were in the athletic group, I was here last night and I was sharing with the fact that we are all born in this state of original sin and it's sins that we didn't necessarily do. No, it wasn't your sin of just cheating on your test. It wasn't just your sin of having sex before marriage. No, it wasn't just your sin on extorting that money. It wasn't just your sin of lying. It was Adam's original sin in the Garden of Eden that has been passed on down to all mankind. So mankind has a sin problem. Can I get an amen? And if you don't, then you need to look at your neighbor and hit them and tell them, you got a sin problem and you sure enough know it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know you're sitting next to friend. You know you got a sin problem. I don't want you to be enslaved to sin here anymore. Nobody in this room. Because there's been a remedy. We're dying to live. It says, for one who has died has been set free from sin. You see, Jesus walked this earth and was tempted at all points, the Bible says, yet without sin. So that made Jesus a perfect sacrificial lamb, blood for blood. So Jesus, what he did is he died on the cross and gave his blood in our stead. So therefore, that made him the perfect sacrifice in order to conquer death. So since he conquered death, therefore, I've got to identify with what Jesus did. And if I identify with Jesus did, then I can pass from death unto life. Can I get an Amen. That passing from death to life is a simple belief. You might say, Jonathan, what do I need to do? I gave this analogy last night. I'm going to give it again. If there was a burning building and it was on fire and you were trapped, your oxygen levels were cut off and you could not breathe. It's a scary situation. 
If anybody's ever been in a uh, smoke inhalation problem, it's, a, it's scary. You can't breathe. You're about to faint, but then this big buff man, like this guy sitting right here, big old muscles just coming out of every part of his body, comes in, picks you up, takes you up out of the building. But maybe I'll pick another guy. He's kind of doubting his stature right now. But anyway, picks you up, takes you up out of the building, carried out. The headlines in the paper the next morning, you know, what are they going to say? Are they going to say, hey, I, uh, I chose to hop on this strong man's back and rescue myself out of the building. Is that what it's going to say? No, uh, I don't think so, right? Is the headline going to say, I helped myself out the building. I'm so thankful I saved myself. Uh, I don't think so. The headline's going to say, my hero, this man was there and he came and he picked me up and he took me out of this burning building and he saved me. Amen? You see, that's our state before Jesus. We are at a point of oxygen's cut off, cannot breathe. When you don't have Jesus in your life, you are at that state. That means that you attempt to do things and they continue to fall short. You keep trying to reach after God, but you can't just reach him. See, there's no human efforts that can get you into the Father's arms. None. None. No, not one. There is no righteous one. None. Not one. The only way you can get there is by believing on the one that already did what you can't do. And his name is who? I can't hear you asking you who? He is the only one. So it's through belief that I transition from death to life. It's in belief in what Jesus Christ did for me on the cross that I can take my proverbial lamp and plug it into the wall. Then that's when things become clear. It goes on to say in here, for the death he died, he died to sin. Say once and for all. Mm -hmm. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourself dead to sin and alive to God. I need you to say that with me. Say dead to sin but alive to God. That's what I want college students to be, dead to sin, but alive to God. But does that mean I don't sin anymore? No, I didn't say that. I don't mean you don't end up sinning anymore, but you reckon yourself as dead to sin. You see, it's just like this. Some of you guys are riding your bicycles and you're riding down the road, but then you're always looking off to the ditch. Now, if you're riding your bike, see, my son's a cyclist. Justice, Jay Cycles is his Instagram. He loves to ride his bike all around town. But you know, when you're riding, you need to look in the direction you're going. Can I get an amen? Because if you look over in the ditch, guess what's going to happen after a while? You're going to be in the ditch, right? I'm trying to get you all as college students, 20-somethings, faculty, to not just focus and always looking at your sin. Stop looking at your sin because Jesus already took care of it. Well, let me go ahead and try to fix this real quick. Let me go ahead and try to get up off this blunt real quick. I'm tired of smoking. I'm tired of lying. Let me go ahead and try to fix this, fix that. And then I'm going to go to church. Uh, whose plan was that? That wasn't Jesus' plan. Jesus' plan was come to me as you are and believe in what I've already done for you and I will help you to overcome your sin problem. Can I get an amen? You see, sin should not separate you and God anymore when my Savior, Jesus Christ, died on the cross for it. See, his death was not in vain, so I'm trying to get you to be dead to sin and alive to God. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. You might say, what does that mean? How many of y'all are pet owners? Yeah. When you first get a little puppy or a dog or anything like that, it just runs around, can't stand up. You know, I am not a pet lover. Don't, don't, tell, don't tell nobody because I have customers all over the city. I have to deal with dogs. All you have to do is just touch it right here and, and it won't bark anymore. I touch it and it stops barking. All you got to do is let it sniff you. All you got to let it do is pee on your leg and then he won't. <laughs> I'm like, come on. How many things I got to do to get this dog to get off me, you know? But any of you guys that are farmers or anything like that, you see how animals act. Animals just follow their own fleshly urgings. Are, am I right or wrong? 
Oh, I'm right. You like look, look on the highway one of these days. You see roadkill, don't you? You see deer. A lot of times those deer are dead on the highway because a, a deer smell, smelt a woman. Mm. And they smelt that scent and said, I'm going to get you, woman. <laughs> and he said, I don't care. Semi-trucks, big old 18-wheelers on the highway, he don't even care. He said, I'm coming to get you. I'm going to get you. We, we don't need to act like animals that are being driven by our passions and our flesh. Can I get an amen, SNU students? Amen? If God establishes boundaries in our life, we should respect them, amen? Yeah, 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 yeah. If, if, if this much alcohol is, is good and you had a great time, but this much leads you to drunkenness, then that means you need to respect that boundary. Can I get an amen? Yeah, that's right, that's right. If I'm gonna use my body as the temple of the Holy Spirit, save myself to marriage, when the nice looking buff guy comes along, I'm gonna say, not today, young man. This is God's temple. Can I get an amen? Right? I'm not going to be like that deer just chasing around because I am no longer a slave to sin. I am alive. So since I'm alive, I'm going to do alive type things. And alive type things sometimes means staying within God's boundaries so that you can produce true abundant life. Can I get an amen? Some of y'all looking at me like, what you talking about? I hit on the sex thing a little bit. Well, I, I had to keep my boundaries, kept my virginity till I got married. Then got blessed with this beautiful woman, Lisa Renee Hill. Oh my goodness, she's gorgeous. Y'all with me? Woo! I didn't think I was going to be able to get the woman that looks this good. So I'm happy that I had not slept with any other woman because I wanted to live and have a good life, not be nervous when I go to the doctor and wonder what I caught, y'all with me. I didn't want to have to worry about if she's pregnant and I had a baby out of wedlock, y'all with me. I had six children by one woman and she's the only woman I had sex with because I died to live. I died and reckoned myself dead in Christ so that I can live an abundant life with this married woman that I'm with for 27 years. I use that as an example, but you got to look in your life. What are the dead things in your life? What are the things that are not producing fruit? Then you're probably trying to do them in your own strength. You need to reckon yourself dead with Christ and alive to God. And this is what you do. You present your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin will have no more dominion over you since you are not under the law, but under grace. I'm asking a few of you all to release your shackles and allow sin to no longer be your master. Because I know someone who went up on a bloody cross and suffered and died for you so you could live on this campus. And then when you begin to live on this campus, you can be a light for someone else. My heartbeat is discipleship. That's what I love to do. Sit across the table with men and young boys and mentor and disciple them and shepherd families that are eager to grow in Christ. This campus and you being here at this campus, you're here for a purpose. You're here so that you can live so that others may be able to live also. Can I get an amen? Yeah, you got to stop thinking about yourself and woe is me and recognize you got to become who you are in Christ first. And then once you are who are you are in Christ, then that will reflect to others. And then you will be able to share the same life that you have. What is the action point today? The action point today is that you need to be dying to live. And the way you die is by praying to God and identifying and saying, Lord Jesus, my life that I've lived to this point is nothing but me being a dead man or dead woman walking. It's only been for my own glory. I haven't even been doing my own life for you, God. So there's an S word called surrender. And that's when you just sit up here and you wave the white flag and say, I'm done. Over! I'm not living my life for myself anymore. I'm going to identify with what Christ did for me so I can experience what it means to be an alive track star, an alive volleyball player, an alive engineer, an alive mathematician, an alive graphic designer, an alive politician. Are y'all with me? 
y'all aren't just looking at a preacher changed to a pulpit. I told my daddy, who was a pastor, I would never be on nobody's pulpit. You ain't getting me in front of people to, talking all day long. I'm not doing that. But now you can see that's what I'm doing, right? Don't ever tell God no, right? But I'm alive in my engineering field. I meet more people in the engineering field than I ever do that come through our church walls. Y'all with me? So I'm praying with people in their houses, in their front lawns, helping them through depression and things like that. It's because I'm not a Christian just on Sunday. I'm a Christian every day of the week. That life is not just bound to the four walls of a church. That life oozes out in everything that we do. Can I get an amen? You don't have to become a religious studies major to have an effect for Jesus Christ. You have an effect in whatever major that you have chosen. Can I get an amen? What I'm asking is there are some students in here that are going to make a choice that are dying to live and identify with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus so they can experience true life. I know I yell a lot, but I get excited about this message. So I'm going to ask you right now if you bow your heads as we're closing so that we can say a word of prayer. I know you have a lot left to do today, but I want this moment to be solemn for you. And I want you to pray this prayer if you're choosing at this moment to die to live. If you're choosing to die to live. Thank you, Jesus. At, under the sound of your own breath, repeat this after me. Heavenly Father, today I'm making a choice to identify with Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection so that I can experience true life now true life now I'm making a decision right now to repent and turn from my wicked ways that have not been aligned with God so that I can follow the true life giver Jesus arrest my life Holy Spirit come in my life rule and reign through me through my major, through my hands, through these members of righteousness, through my body, rule through me, Father. And I will live for you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I love you, SNU.